الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله كيف حالكم جميعا يا ايها الاخوه اخوات we would like to present inshallah ta'ala here from mahad ibn taymiyyah a new show rather we're going to be dealing with the sit down the concept of the sit down process and the questions that matter the most the important questions that matter the most how to properly conduct a sit down what do the sit down consist of this is what the show will be covering inshallah um everything that deals with the process of the sit down and i know that there are some who um might have came across some information pertaining to the sit down process within uh the issue dealing with the nikah is something that may be, may or may not be validated within the sharia okay of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nonetheless over here in the west we do have what we call a sit down process all right so we're going to inshallah ta'ala talk about that we want to be able to delve into this particular show just to help us better on to know what to focus on how to properly conduct that sit down okay and this is the most crucial component um along with some other major factors for finding and um a suitable mate okay and finding a suitable bit suitable mate and also the reason why doing this particular show i think is important especially in this time not because of the simple fact that men and women is going to you know fraternize and, and things like that it is for the simple fact that a lot of the rhetoric from the west um has been shoved down the throats of many of the muslim males and muslim females and that is the modern uh the modern ideology or the modern perspective you know in terms of relationships values goals and standards and a lot of them doesn't have anything to do with the islamic values or standards or relationship goals or the objectives so um a lot of the people especially male or female they are affected by this um tremendously so when they go to look for a mate they are coming with their modern the modern modern cap on rather than their islamic cap on all right and then they are projecting their standards based off of that modern standard which may or may not go with the book or the sunnah and they don't give relevance to that all right so <clears throat> before you know with just covering you with this, I'm just going over this is like a brief little introduction of just going over what the show going to be about inshallah ta'ala the times and the dates I will let you guys know but this will be the consist of the show we would deal with it we call it the sit down it deals with the process um I want to go over a couple of ayats and I'm going to address an issue inshallah ta'ala in this particular introduction to give you an insight of what we're talking about okay first and foremost we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he already made it clear when he says wa idh qala rabbuka lil malaikati inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa al ayat and this ayat in surah barakah Allah jalla wa ala has solidified the position of um the male okay the position of the male was given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all right the position of the male was given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what do i mean by that meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man first and I, and this is you know and I don't I'm talking to Muslims so I shouldn't have to keep going into the fact of this is not sexism this is not anything that deal with the fem, uh the feminine mute um movement how they mention how this is this and that because if that's the case then we have a problem with what Allah jalla wa ta'ala has laid down so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says remember when your lord said to the angels we're going to place man as a regiment or as a khalifa on the earth okay So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him those particular things. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa min ayatihi and, and and this verse is going to be poured back up later on. Wa min ayatihi an khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwajan litaskunu ilayha wa ja'ala baynakum mawaddatan wa rahmah. Al-ayat. In Surah Ar-Rum Allah jalla wa ala he says and from his signs is that he has made he has created you. All right? Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says an khalaqa lakum. He has created you. 
men and futhikum, and from among you. So here Allah Jalla wa is talking to males. And from among the males, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has did what? He has created azwajin. He has created your meat. Okay, he has created the woman, azwajin. He has made them partners. Okay, litaskunu uh, ilaha, in order that you may live with her, enjoy, join with her in, sink, in, uh, in tranquility. And he has placed between you that mawadda and that rahma. Okay, uh, also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also mentions um, a beautiful verse where Allah says, Ya yuhan nas, ittaku rabbakum, alladhi khalakakum min nafsin wahida, wa khalaka minha zawjaha, wa batha minhuma rijalim kathirin al-ayat. In Surah An-Nisa, the first verse, uh, the chapter 4, Allah Jalla wa ala, he solidified this again. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it extremely clear that the that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O mankind, fear your Lord, who have created you from a single soul. Okay? That single soul. That single soul is our... Um, Yeah, that single soul is our father, Adam Ali, salatu wa salam, which we all know this. We know these verses, heard these verses before. And then he says, from that single soul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created um, <clears throat> his mate, which is Hawa, our mother, um, which is Eve, alayhi salam, alayhi salam. Uh, and then from them, he created countless many, many men and women, all right? So we know that the trajectory there is that man was first then woman was created from the rib of man as we have in that beautiful authenticated hadith that comes in Riyadh Salihin the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that uh, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fear the way that you treat woman and he said rightly indeed women were created from a bent rib which uh, gives to the fact that what solidify the fact that woman comes from a man my point of bringing all of this up is just to show us that man has a position women have a position all right and they are to become mates. And the way that they become mates is through a legal process, which is known as nikah, which is come as marriage, all right? So, understanding these roles is extremely important, especially in the time that we live in, because these roles have been misapplied and, mis and, and redirected, and <clears throat> there are other people taking on these roles who doesn't suppose to take on these roles. For example, there has been role reversal, um, that has been taking place on for years, whereas though the woman will take on the um, the attributes and the qualities of the man, vice versa, the man will take on the attributes and qualities of the woman. Um, a lot of the feminist movement, a lot of the different um, ideologies and the modern concepts and perspectives out there are twisting up the narrative on how man and woman supposed to operate and how that family unit supposed to structure. Okay, tight. So then Allah Jalla wa Ali, he goes on to mention something very, very important to us. How do the man and woman conduct themselves? How do they get along? Who's supposed to take the leadership role? Who doesn't supposed to take the leadership role? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he solidified in Surah Tanisa when he says, Ar-rijalu kawwamuna ala nisa'i bima faddalallahu ba'duhum ala ba' wa bima anfaku min amwalihim al-ayat. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off by saying the famous verse that a lot of the females probably already memorized by now. I think they put us men in check, and rightly so. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that the men are the uh, qawwam, okay? They are the maintainers and the protectors and the sustainers of the woman, okay? Their role, that qawwam actually, and we did a um, video, you can go back to that, where we cover this. In, in detail um, from the tafsir of Sheikh Hathimi, rahmatullah ta'ala where he explains this clearly that kawam actually signifies leadership, all right? And just because you are male doesn't necessarily mean you have kawam, okay? And that's something that a lot of us men have to learn. Just because you are a male doesn't mean you have the qualities of kawam. That means you are eligible for kawam, but you have to fit those criterions and different things like that because uh, again we talked about rujula masculinity and being a male it's two different things okay uh, a person could be a male but they might don't have the masculine you know the rujula that they're supposed to have that accompany along with them being a male all right <clears throat> so that's a different story and a different topic anyway nonetheless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he has made the men the leaders okay the maintainers all right the providers the sustainers of the woman and this is due to the fadl that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed 
one over the other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the woman a fadl and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the men a fadl. But he has given the men a fadl over the woman. All right. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down. And then he says also due to what the men spends from his wealth upon the woman. All right. So then Allah jalla wa ala when he talks about the ahkam of talaq, divorce, and the likes like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the rights of men and women, meaning the husband and the wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَّهُنَّ مِثْلُ He talks about the females having rights similar to that uh, on reasonable terms to that which men have, okay? Allah jalla mentioned that they have uh, similar rights which as men have, يعني, uh, in terms of reasonable doubt. Then Allah says, وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ الدَّرَجَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the men we have given them, again, a degree over the wives. So the husbands have a degree over the wife. All right. According to Islam, according to Allah Azza wa Jalla, the husband has a degree over the wife. Okay. Tayyip. So Allah says, Wallahu Aziz when Hakim. He ended that verse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, He is Allah Aziz Al Hakim. So we see in all of these verses, we're solidifying the point that there is a direct role that the man play and the female play. And when they come together, there are rights that must be shared between them. All right. Now, the first part of the process of a sit down, the most crucial part of the sit down is not the sit down itself. It's not when sister Aisha meets brother Muhammad. All right. That's, that's how it works. All right. That's not the most crucial part. All right. And this is why a lot of the times the questions that are acts between the two people who are sitting down there are not the most important questions and the most valid questions to be asked all right and you have to understand why because the first crucial point of the sit down process all deals with the wakil i mean the wali all right the wali is the crucial component to the first stage of the sit down and you might say why is i'm saying that because that's what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and that's what his messenger actually says all right, that it is upon the wali to seek out a suitable mate for that woman. All right, it's not upon herself. It's upon the wali, the guardian, to seek out a suitable mate for that woman, okay? So that falls on the responsibility of the guardian to make sure that he is presenting her to someone who's gonna fit those Islamic qualities and standards that will be suitable for both of them to live in harmony. Do you get it? All right. So that's why that's the first part of the sit down process deals with the wali or the wakil. And this is why it's in crucial and important that we don't skip past that step in the sense of I don't need a wali. I don't need a wakil. And I do know that we, the times that we live in, I know a lot of times that a lot of people be busy. A lot of the wakils and they had a representative on behalf of the wali. And they might not be the Wali because a lot of Muslim sisters, especially here in the West, don't probably have any Muslim male relatives um, that will fit into that line to be able to take care. So they go to the masjid or, they, you know, and they go to someone appointed over, uh, over their affairs and so forth like that to help them out. And I know it can become overwhelming, especially for those people in that position. OK. And nevertheless, that's the first crucial component of the sit down. All right. So we're going to we're going to delve on that in detail. Not today. It's just an introduction. The next process, all right, after the Wali, and I mean after the Wali, because that's the first part of the, the crucial component. The next process of the sit down uh, that should take place now, okay, because once the Wali finds that suitable mate for the sister, okay, then he can go ahead and conduct that sit down, okay. So the next process now is once they have the meetup, that now they're both understanding what questions to ask, okay? And again, before you ask your questions, your questions should, you should already, before you even meet up or sit down, the wali should have educated the woman on the rights that she has over her husband, okay? If she was to become married, these are the rights that you have over your husband. That's what she's obligated to know, the rights that she has over the husband. Likewise, the husband who's coming to sit down, he should already have the knowledge, you understand, of the rights that the wife has over him. All right. Many people don't approach a sit down like this. 
A lot of people don't know the rights that the husband has over, or they know some rights and they get it all mixed up and they, and they don't understand how to base those values and those standards. Attraction plays a part within the sit down process, but attraction is in the main feature. Okay, that's not the main feature. All right, finance definitely plays a crucible point, but that shouldn't be the main, that's not the main feature neither. The main feature again, is making sure you conduct it the way that it's supposed to be conducted. Like for example, the Wali, get a suitable mate and you have the knowledge of what's the right supposed to be upon you, the rights upon you, and both of y'all fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then when y'all ask y'all questions, y'all question is gonna be based and pertaining to that. You understand? And the job of the woman and her question is to make sure that that man can fulfill those rights which Allah has obligated upon him. You see? Likewise, the, um, the, the, um, the obligation, the, 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 the male, you know, once he's sitting down with the sister, his questions should be pertaining to the fact of knowing that, knowing, understanding that, he, that the rights that she has over him is that he can fulfill those rights, that he can take care of those rights. Because the Prophet ﷺ made it clear. What did he say? He says, anyone from amongst you that are young, a chemical and abuse of Allah, he told you to do what? He said, fast. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to mean. If you become capable, Meaning that if a person from amongst you become capable physically, he's capable, and financially, he is capable, if he has those means. And a part of the physical thing, so no one get this construed, he should be mentally prepared as well, all right? He should be spiritually adept, I mean, uh, uh, equipped as well, all right? So all of that is included in the physical um, capability, all right? So not just can he procreate, all right? that he doesn't have a defect, because this is also mentioned in the, uh, the books of Fiqh dealing with marriage, by the way. A woman can actually ax out of a marriage if she was deceived and she didn't know that her husband had a deformity. Do you understand like that? This is a aib. This is something that the early Maddie talks about. There are chapters in the books of Fiqh that deals with this issue head on. So what I'm saying to you is that the man in the physical part, the Prophet has mentioned that you're capable and have the, it's the, that's the thought. I mean, you're capable, meaning that you are mentally, spiritually, physically capable. All right, and then you are financially capable as well to be able to take on the task. In other words, fulfill the main rights, all right? You're not going to be able to fulfill every right the woman have over you, and vice versa. The woman is not going to be able to fulfill every right the husband has over her, and this is 100% facts. Why is this 100% facts? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear when Allah says in Surah Tanisa, that you will never, walan, Allah used the land. He told Muhammad something, you will never be able to, um, yeah, I mean, to, you can deal justice, that's what he was required of it, but you'll never be able to have that love within the heart equally distribute between your wives. That can't happen. Allah says in Surah Al-Ahzab, we have not placed two hearts in one man. That can't happen. So what Allah obligated upon the man, all right, taking in consideration that the man heart can never be equally distributed between two women or three women or four, which is halal, he obligated for them to make sure that they are just in between their time allotment and their provisions. Do you understand? He made this as strictly clear. You have to be. There's no shortage in that area. You have to be equally in that regard, all right? Because this is something that you have a capability of doing. Type. So this is the sit down process. Now the issue I want to address, which again, this is the show is going to be addressing the modern uh, perspective and trying to get our Muslim males, brothers and our Muslim sisters to move towards the Islamic perspective of relationship goals, values and standards. All right not adopting our values, our relationship goals, and standards from a modern perspective, all right? This must be made clear because you might hear something, for example, and you hear a lot of Muslim sisters, they say this. If the man cannot, um, they have mentioned this statement, if the man cannot fulfill my spiritual and emotional needs, then I don't need him. And off the bat, you might say there's nothing wrong with this statement. You might say this statement here is 100% correct. And in actuality, when you really delve deep into it, it's not actually 100% correct. Because spiritually, he is required to fulfill your spiritual needs. And that is to a certain degree. He is to educate you. 
He is to encourage you. He is to teach you. He is to what? Make sure he um uh he is to give you that um constructive criticism, that uh guidance. That's his role. Your emotional needs now. And this is why and I'm still waiting to this day. I do. I mean, I'm going to bring some Athars that can tie into it, and a verse that can tie into it that I mentioned earlier. But I don't hear nothing clear within the Book of the Sunnah talking about the one of the rights of the husband is one of the rights that the wife have over the husband is that he has to fulfill her emotional needs. I don't even hear that even being mentioned in that way. All right, you can ask the question, Inshallah, Taala. If I get time, I answer. If I don't know, then we got to make sure we go back to it. But do you understand? So the emotional needs, and the reason why I'm saying this is because you have to look at this. Woman is a ball of emotion. All right? This is true. Her emotions are unstable at times, which she may or may not have control over. She is prone to mood swings, which she may or may not understand why she's going through those mood swings. I'm not just talking about the time during pregnancy. You know, her body goes through a lot of changes. Her body goes through changes with her menstrual cycle. Her body goes through changes through pregnancy. Her body goes through changes through different things. So there are different stages where the woman's emotions might fluctuate. Do you understand? So her emotional needs as a whole, the man is not responsible to fulfill that. But he is responsible, again, he is responsible to be in tune with her and to aid her and to support her and to be supportive and to be understanding. And that's why I'm gonna quote a lot of those uh, Athars and a lot of those, and that verse I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna quote that to give that support. You understand? But to make a statement that he has to fulfill my emotional needs, that I can't find in the book in the Sunnah, and I'm nobody again. If you find something in the book in the Sunnah that indicates that he's 100% of the word about your emotional needs, I, I, you know, I'll be willing to accept it if it has some haq behind it. I don't know, know if a person can do that because a woman is subject to a lot of emotional, you know, turbulence. She is. So sometimes a man may not, may not know why she's even in that mood. All right. Now, I had a female tell me that the, um, she mentioned that even if he doesn't understand why I'm in that mood, he should be um, supportive enough to help me go through that mood. And to be honest with you, in some parts I agree, in some parts I disagree. And the reason why I'm saying that, and I'm going to explain it, and you might don't agree with me. Some parts I agree, because sometimes if your emotion is not tied to a simple fact of, okay, say for example, you might be emotionally unstable. And he can't get down to the, and we men, we are rational. And, and we're normally like, sometimes we're tunnel vision. Women can actually write multiple, can actually multiple you know, you know what I'm talking about, the motorly thinks. I mean, so, so sometimes some men can be rational. So the man is going to try to get down to the bottom. That's how he's going to approach that project. I mean, I mean, that project, approach that problem. He's going to look at it and say, okay, what's the main thing here? What can I do to help ease that? Now, as far as your mental state, I think the husband should help out. He should be supportive in that case. I mean, if you don't have the means to deal and address all of your mental problems, then he should um, direct you towards and help in the process, even if you have to finance you towards the proper people to help you with your mental state. I, I do believe that he should be a part of that process, your mental state again. And we mentioned that before about being called wham, okay? Because that's extremely important about being called wham, you know, helping making sure that the mental state is um, definitely healthy, all right? You don't want to be in a relationship where the mental state isn't healthy, all right? You always want to have a healthy you know, mental state, okay? Because that's very important. Um, he should help out if you're sad, okay? He's responsible to help out if you're sad, you're distraught, you're upset, you um, depress, you're distressed. Do you understand? These things here, to his humble capability, the man should be uh, a part of the process of helping you get through that journey in the best way he can. If he's not, um, if he doesn't have the, uh, qualifications or he doesn't have the knowledge or the know-how to do it at the very least he should help you get to that point all right now the reason why I'm saying that is because the verse that I was talking about earlier what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says from among the signs is that he created for you uh, mates from among your own selves talking to the men he created wives so that you may live with her all right then Allah says 
So Allah mentioned mawadda and rahmah. When you look in the tafsir, if you go back from court to be another, you're going to see a lot of different statements from the ulama in regards to what mawadda actually means, even though we know it means love, linguistically, okay, and affection. And you're going to hear rahmah. Some of the scholars say that the, the, the mawadda, all right, the mawadda, uh, some of the scholars say the mawadda is the childbearing, is, is, is the procreating, them having children, all right? So some of the tafsir mention that, and some of the tafsir mention other things. But in that mawadda and rahmah, the emotions can play a part in that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed that affectionate between you two. Which is interestingly enough because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting us to uh, ready, uh, readily um, identify that it is due to his blessings and his nitma, his favor, that he placed that amongst us. All right, That he didn't put us together just to procreate and we didn't have no feelings or no emotions regarding that. No, he actually placed that. He actually placed where Allah was to have that bond for one another, that love for one another, that affection for one another, that care, that romantic side to have, that mercy for one another, that being, you know, helping and things like that, and being supportive, etc. Allah placed that with all of that can fall under in that verse, mawadda wa rahma. Okay. Then the statement or the ayah of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala. I mean Abu Darada, Afwan. Abu Darada, Rahmatul Amin, Radiallahu Ta'ala Alayhi, he says something to his wife that was very profound. And the ayah or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, he says, Allah says, and those who repress their anger and they pardon people, all right, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen, and Allah loves those who do good. Um, Abu Darada, he said to his wife, he said, if I am angry, then appease me. And if you are angry, I will appease you. All right. He says, if we do not do that, it will cause us to split and separate. So here we have an insight, a look into this athar, all right, narration from one of the companions on how emotions does play a part. All right, how understanding that. Okay, so sometimes you don't want to be happy or not acknowledge the fact that your spouse is unhappy. You don't want to be in a jubilant state and your spouse is in a dismay, a dismay. You understand, your, your spouse is in, is, is in a down state. Okay, you, that will cause a conflict. Okay, that will cause a conflict between you guys. You want to make sure, no, okay, if, if she's down, then you want to make sure you try to help bring up her spirits. You want to try to bring her up. You want to try to get to the bottom of why she's down. And you don't want to be try to, you know, be super happy. Likewise, vice versa. The wife should pay attention to the husband. Okay? The wife should pay attention to the husband as well. Okay? If the husband is down, then you want to know why your husband is feeling down. Okay? Why is your husband is not happy? You don't want to be in your jubilant state, your happy mode, and at the time your husband is in an unhappy mode. All right, so this is what I get from that Abu Darada statement that you can see that some emotions does play a part in that. Also, there's another athar that I get from Abu Abdullah ibn Abbas, ta'ala the Prophet sallam, cousin. He said that I do not ask, he said, I do not ask for all of my rights from my wife for fear that I do not fulfill all of hers. And that's a profound statement. That's something that, you know, books can be written on. And it gives us an insight and a gleam because you, you have to understand that there are things as humans that we are prone to make mistakes on a constant basis. Allah made that clear in the Hadith Qudsi of the Hadith Abu Dhar. Well, Allah Jawala made it. He says, Ya, he says, Ya, uh, Allah SWT, he mentions, um, Ya, ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, and he says, all of you, kulukum, all of you, all right, uh, make mistakes. All of you commit sins day and night, and you have to seek, you have to seek my sins, which shows us that we are prone to make mistakes. So we're going to make errors. So you can't expect perfection on any level with your spouse. And the fulfillment of your haq, all right, to that extent. And even though the husband's haq is greater than the wife's haq, 
as it comes in authenticated as a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, that you would never fulfill the rights of your husband, even if he was to tell you what? If pus was coming out of his nose and he tell you to suck it out, you would never what? Be able to fulfill it. All right? So we know that this is, this is haq. But even so, it doesn't give, as Abdullah bin Abbas is showing us, it doesn't give a person the right to try to hold someone to that standard because it will never be fulfilled. It will never be fulfilled. And that plays a major role. So I just want us to understand that Islam does address these issues. All right? Not in a modern term, not in a modern way, and not in the concept of how they consider the power couple or consider the relationship goals, because a lot of those relationship goals is based on other people's lives. All right? A lot of those relationship goals is based on other people's lives. There are three main ingredients that we will get into in detail that plays a part in the question, question uh, the questionnaire stage um, at the, at the um, sit down when you're conducting it that both parties should make sure they pay attention to. And if you look how the way the dean is set up with the guardian seeking out the, the suitable mate and so forth and how the Prophet Muhammad gave the advice on what mate to, to seek out and how the Prophet Muhammad gave the advice for the husband and what mate to seek out, these three things are covered. All right, and that is spirituality that deals with deen. Spirituality is there, all right, that deals with deen. Spirituality is one of those key components that you want to make sure you're in sync with, all right? Compatibility plays a major role, don't get me wrong, and sometimes we got a misunderstanding with compatibility. Some people think compatibility is that the person got to like everything I like, or he got to agree with everything I agree with. Or this is the way I'm used to doing this, how I was raised, this is the way it's supposed to be done. That's not compatibility. And if he likes everything that you like, that doesn't mean that he's compatible. And that's a major misunderstanding that a lot of people have, whether male or female. All right? That's why we have what we call compromise. Okay? Y'all come from two different backgrounds. Okay? Y'all might come from two different lands. Y'all come from two different homes. Y'all come with two different sets of standards. So how can we just make where y'all are going to agree? I'm not going to agree on 100% of everything. That I got nothing to do with y'all not being compatible. This is why the compatibility in the dean is aimed at what? Are y'all compatible in the dean? If the answer is yes, that compatibility is what counts. That's the compatibility you're looking for. Because if y'all compatible in the dean, that means y'all both going to submit to what needs to govern y'all to. The book and the sun nut. Y'all both going to submit through the standards, okay? The values that the dean placed. Y'all supposed to submit to that. And that's going to give y'all a ground that y'all both can walk on, all right? The other thing that you want to worry about uh, is, and I don't know if I really want to call this mentally, but uh, I will, uh, the, you know, the integrity is a part of the dean. You want to worry about um, the spirituality, the mental state plays a major role you need to know that the person you're marrying is sane and what i mean by sane i'm not talking about just you know but they're rational they have the um the skill set to understand the task at hand to understand marriage and all of its um you know and everything that's tied to it understand rights and fulfilling it understand family and so forth understanding uh, all of these different things. So they have to be mentally capable, all right? So you want to make sure that they have the intelligence for that because if the man doesn't have what we call rushed and he's not a person that is capable that can maintain and take care of different things, then how is it going to be a help to anyone? It's not going to be a help to himself nor to the woman that he's going to marry. And this is why they mention in the rights, I mean, in the pillars of uh, a Wakil and the Guardian is that the Guardian must be Rashid. All right, the guardian must be Rashid because he has to make that sound decision to get you a suitable mate. Not someone who look flashy, look appealing, look attractive, have some aspects, but the main aspects he doesn't have. Do you understand? Will cause a problem, all right? The next thing uh, is what we call the, um, the financial stage, all right? Because this, this, this is major. So we have spirituality, we have the mental, intelligent, slash whatever, and then we have the financial capability, all right? So when you look at your questions, it should surround these things because it's important. And the financial part is not whether the person is rich because that's not a requirement for marriage. 
being rich is not a requirement to marry anyone. You won't find it in no hadith, you won't find it in no sunnah, you won't find it in no athar, you won't find it in the Quran. That's not according to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moved over and over. He mentioned, let the rich spend according to his means, let the poor spend according to his means. That isn't a requirement that the person has to be rich. Okay, again, stop living other people's lives. And you know what it is. We all are affected. We are affected by our social media. We are affected by society. We are affected by where we live at. All of us, including me, we are affected to some extent. Depending on how we fight that effect, you know, and that influence is important. You understand? But we all affected in some way. Okay? So watching other people's lives and looking at, you know, not just celebrities, but looking at your, your girlfriend life and how things look from, from the outside looking in because you're not in. But you're from the outside looking in and you're like, this is exactly what I need. No, you can't base that off of that. Now, the finance that that man is responsible for is the part where as though he can fulfill the rights that you have upon him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set forth. Can he provide shelter? Can he provide food? Can he provide clothing? Can he provide your personal needs as far as your hygiene? If he is capable of providing for that, then he is capable of getting married because this is what the Prophet mentioned. All right? Then he has the means to get married. He don't have to come to us, sit down and say, okay, he don't make four, he's not making um, 60,000, 80,000 a year. He's not the guy for me. All right? And you hear a lot of, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm not knocking sisters that are in that realm. Like, you know, if a sister is making 60000 herself and she's making 70000 80000 herself, you know, she probably wants someone that's going to be in it. That's natural. It's natural because if you look at the incident with uh, Osama ibn Zayd when Allah talks about him in the Quran, the Surah Al-Hazab, where the Prophet ﷺ married him off to Zainab. And Zainab was, um, at that time, was a free woman. And uh, they had different class. They had, their, their class was different. And he was, you know, and he mentioned that uh, he was, a, you know, a free slave. So that she didn't, it didn't harmonize between them. They were from two different classes, two different things. So that definitely happened. So sometimes you might have someone who's used to being accustomed to. That's why Sheikh Salih Fouzan said, what? You provide for the woman what they used to being accustomed to. No? You provide for the woman what they used to being accustomed to. You treat them in that status where they used to be accustomed. That's what you have. But financial does play a part. You don't have to make an uh, um, substantial amount of, uh, substantial amount of uh, money, but they need to have the fulfillment of the requirements of that they can take care of you. So this is what I want the show to be about, inshallah ta'ala. So I keep you guys posted when we start, but these are some of the things I'm going to address individually. You know, go down the line. We're going to try to get into them to understand the process of the sit down. All right. Um, the attraction part plays a part. I'm not going to go into that right now. We will go into that because sometimes you females and it's more so, I mean, it's, it's with both. I can't just say it's with the females. It's with, it's with the females if they, are, if they are just purely going off their emotions in regards to attraction. Oh, he's handsome, this, 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 and that. And then they would throw away all of the other stuff they, that they needed to worry about. They'd throw it away. This is why they can't be guardians for themselves. You know what I mean? It just makes it clear because you can't throw away those things. He can be the most handsomest guy in the world. Right, but he might don't have those components that you need to stabilize that family for you. All right, and you don't want to fall in. And to, for the men, you don't want to fall into that either because, again, she might don't have those components that stabilize the marriage for you. So you want to make sure that that's clear. So, inshallah, ta'ala, if you have any questions pertaining to, to uh, I heard somebody asked a question earlier, um, but if you have any questions pertaining to the sit down process, how it starts, I'll let you guys know. When we're going to start the show and how we're going to conduct it, inshallah. Thank you all for tuning in. Whatever we said that was incorrect, definitely it's from ourselves. And shaitan, we said it's correct. It's from Allah, which I will. Subhanallah, we have the ashad one and I stuck with the word. To be late. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.